She thought it would be a fun reunion with friends, but Mary Jo Kopechny's last night ended in dark water. Was it a simple accident, or was there a sinister cover-up at play? This week's episode is Chappaquiddick. A bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. I just, I have a really weak heart, I think, because I like. God, is this where you. Tell us all you're dying. Oh, no, I have a very strong I, heart. <laughs> I mean, like a weak soul because I just feel like I can see the good in people. And I've been struggling a lot with seeing the good in Ted Kennedy. <laughs> what do you think was good about him? Um, well, first of all, in my I'm reading uh, Give, Us the, Give Us Our Ballot, which is a voter rights book. Oh, nice. And it's like the history of the Voting Rights Act and basically the systematic oppression of people of color over the last, I don't know, 100 years. Yeah. And he was uh, instrumental in getting younger people the right to vote. So there was a bill and that he knew was going to pass, and he slipped in the under eighteen per, or the under under twenty one to so give eighteen to vote provision. Oh. Uh, and his argument was, if you can be sent to die in Vietnam, you should be able to vote. I think that's a good argument. And also, he did a lot of good. Like in the rest of his life, he was a real charitable guy. And apparently, the Kennedys in general were very charitable. Well, I mean, when you're rich, you yeah. Should I be. mean, but exactly. also there was a lot of talk that he was just like a good friend and like a good listener and a super. They said he just had a big heart and he really believed in everything he did. I think it's possible to be have good qualities but still do really terrible things so my question is does someone's actions fundamentally define who they are oh that's a good question and could you can you change or like i do think you can change okay i do think you can change but i think you have to really want to change and really make a lot of effort and work on yourself. To or you so. kill someone and you're like, oh, God, I got to change. Or I'm yeah. going to go to hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot Hopefully of people not. find God in prison. That's true. That type of thing. That's true. Um, but I just wonder that. And I've been trying to be, because it's the Christmas season about to be. Yeah. And not that I'm religious, but I do love Christmas. Oh, and who doesn't? I love, I turned Christmas music on today. And I almost turned it on yesterday. Oh, I got a good, I got a Spotify playlist I'll share. Nice. I, um, but there's the song from Scrooge, which at the end he gets like really choked up and he's like the feeling that we feel on christmas where we take care of each other and we're kind and loving and thoughtful we should be like that every day and mm-hmm. every day can be like that if we want it to be so i was like maybe every day could be like that. <laughs> and then i almost cried in the car when i was driving oh man uh, but it you know like it, this does this def, does this event define you i oh, that's a good question i think that this ev- event defined him not being able to be the president definitely I don't, I mean, when you're a person in the public eye, a celebrity, a politician, whatever it may be, and some scandal happens, Mm -hmm. in the public eye, it kind of does define you. That's true. But but the public eye is also looking for drama and scandal because that's, everybody loves that. It's true. I, I doubt this defined him to his family. Oh, oh, you, they weren't friends. allowed. To, nobody talked about it ever after this. Yeah, not just to like psychiatrists. Rosemary. Anything bad that happens to this family, they just brush it under the rug. Seriously, they were like, "You're not allowed to talk to your psychiatrist about it, because or your psychologist about it, because what if they leave and go tell someone?" It's like, well, that's the point of the psychologist. Yeah. Also, that would be a huge breach of patient patient confidential confidentiality. But what if you're a psychologist and you have the Kennedy and you have the scoop? And who cares if you get oh, sued? Oh, sure, yeah. I'm sure it happens all the time. Yeah. So that was a big thing in this family is you did not bring it up. You didn't talk about it. Um, and yeah, like, like you said with Rosemary, Ted was raised by her. She was. He said she was the most loving person and they were best friends. And then when he was eight, she disappeared. Yeah. And if you listen to the last episode, Rosemary Kennedy was 23 when her dad sent her away mm-hmm. to get a lobotomy and then sent her to Wisconsin, never to be talked about or heard from again. And we didn't bring it up on the last um, episode. But her sister, Esther, was very close to her, Mm -hmm. and because of her, started a program in her own backyard 
for children with mental disabilities, Aww. which became the Special Olympics. There you go. She founded the entire Special Olympics program, and JFK donated tons of money and helped pass bills that would help people with, disabilities. with mental health. And yeah, I mean, so it's just this they whole... all did good. Yeah, they also all did bad. Yeah, it's like, but who hasn't? Who doesn't? cross all of those lines. I, I think sure that too. Have. I was also struggling with Lyndon Johnson because again, in the voting rights act, he passed the voter rights bill and he basically physically threatened George Wallace and was like, I am going to give black Americans the right to vote. I don't care what you say. And they said, George Wallace was like five, nine and Lyndon Johnson was like six, eight. He was mm. like huge. And they said he stood up to him and said that on the flip side, he's George, uh, Lyndon Johnson sent a bunch of people to Vietnam to die. Yeah. So it's this struggle between, I guess that's anything political is this between what you do that benefits others and then the personal slights and horribleness. I guess that's not even personal, sending people to Vietnam. I don't know. It's a lot of tough... I I've mean, been going through a lot of tough moral questions I mean, I, But I think they're all very valid and good. I, As much as we both despise Trump, yes, he has probably done something good in his life that, he, oh, oh, that he, we oh, may, maybe I don't even you, know about. I'll tell you right now what Donald Trump did that was good. He helped Macaulay Culkin find his way in his... <laughs> I, in uh, Home Alone, Alone 2. 2. Yes. The one, there you go. The one good thing. That could be a whole other podcast is me <laughs> ranting about everything in the last week. But no. Yeah. yeah. So that's my question is, you know, or maybe is it like the measure of your harm? Also, I've been watching a lot of The Good Place and like, what do we owe to each other in this like societal contract mm-hmm. of like, you owe, you owe not only just like basic dignity and respect to your fellow man, but like help as much as you can yeah and like i don't know but isn't that crazy though that like you legally don't have to help people nope. if they're in you see you witness a crime or a crime taking place like you're not legally obligated only which kind in of states, comes up to play in this one i was gonna say only in states with good samaritan laws like on seinfeld yes yeah <laughs> then you have to help well we should have a a countrywide good samaritan law yeah because that's the issue is then you can and get the first, sued. The first rule, the first thing we all do is uh, impeach our president. Good that's God. the first good Samaritan law we'll that we s- We'll see what happens. Act that we do. Yeah. We're headed that way. Yep. Yep. So, yep. all right. So, like, say, for instance, you get in a car accident and someone's in the car with you. Maybe try to help them, right? If you can. Maybe. But if you don't, you know what? There's nothing that's legally, well, kind of legally obligating you to. But we'll see that. If you're a Kennedy, that doesn't really matter. There's a different set of rules. So I'm Heather. I'm Christy. And today we're talking about the Chappaquiddick incident. And uh, that's the famous incident. Not even famous. Apparently people didn't really know about it until like the 90s. Yeah, it's infamous. And what have you coined? You've given several very nice monikers to this month, Mark Kennedy month. We're calling it Jovember F. Kennedy. (laughs) (laughs) So this is our very Kennedy November. Jovember F. Kennedy. Yes. Leading up to the 55th assassination of... JFK at the end of the month. That's right. Okay, so let's get into it. Chappaquiddick. On the evening of July 18th, 1969, Ted Kennedy hosted a party at a cottage he had rented on Chappaquiddick Island, just outside of Martha's Vineyard. I think think I'll feel rich when I can go to Martha's Vineyard. Right, or the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. I feel like as a white person, you have made it... uh, Wealth, wealth wise. What did you say as a white person, anybody can go there because it's. We talked last week about how it's the, the rich white people place. I guess to that's go. true. Yeah, it's pretty. Of course, um, anybody can go there. Well, I've never been, but I. There, it's probably an unstated rule that it's mayonnaise island. Yeah, yes, <laughs> like yes, anyone's welcome, but do you dare? A few years ago, there was a hedge fund that rented out a house on Airbnb, and they destroyed it because they could afford to basically where pay for in, it. In, on uh, and like Vineyard. it is in Mar- Martha's Vineyard, and there was all these pictures on Instagram and they had like jello wrestling and they were shooting like vodka out of like squirt guns and it was shenanigans like uh, straight out of Wolf of Wall Wall Street well this party was being thrown as a reunion for six women known as the boiler room girls they had all worked on Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1968 they were given the nickname the boiler room girls because of the windowless office they had shared they were Rosemary Kehoe, Keo, I would say, Esther Newberg, sisters Nance and Mary Ellen Lyons, Susan Tannenbaum, and Mary Jo Kopechny. Mary Jo was well known in Democratic circles in Washington and was really making a name for herself. She had worked for a Florida senator before working on Kennedy's Senate staff. 
And while on Kennedy's staff, she helped write an anti-Vietnam speech for RFK and his address announcing his presidential candidacy. And in the boiler room, they were down there counting delegates that were propo- like mm-hmm. that were pledging themselves to vote for him. So, I mean, these women, RFK was super progressive, and these women had a ton of responsibility and really helped run his campaign. And they, he was beloved. And, like, when she worked for that Florida senator, before she worked for RFK, she kept trying to g- go and get assignments with him. And finally, the senator said, you know what? Why, doesn't she, why don't you just hire her? Because you're the one whose picture she has on her desk. Oh. Um. Like oh, wow. she just thought he was just the cat. Not, and it that wasn't was, like she, a, she had made it if she could work for him. It wasn't like in like a, I love you and I want to be your girlfriend yeah. way. It was like a you are going to save our country yeah. way. Just total admiration. Total, yeah. Yes, Respect. they were all very smart women. Way more than what the press painted them as later. Blonde secretary. Yes. yes. Mary Jo wasn't even supposed to be at the party at Chappaquiddick due to a work commitment. However, she got someone to cover for at the last minute. Because she really wanted to see her friends. Haven't we talked about how that's it's always like, like that? A thin like you're not slice. supposed to be at work. It's always your day. You hear about that like in when people have been like working at a seven eleven or something like that and, and somebody they, comes in to hold them up and they're killed. It's like they weren't even supposed to be working, they just filled in for someone. Yeah. And I have said before, if you are not supposed to be at work, do not go to work. <laughs> Don't just, just pick stay up a at home because nothing it's... good ever comes of it. No joke. It's always like, well, if only they had just gone to bed or if mm-hmm. only they hadn't gone or if all... My, their mother told them to be careful. The other night, oh, I don't remember where. I may have been leaving your house or maybe I was leaving DCH, um, but I got caught in a huge uh traffic jam because of a huge wreck on 70 or on 35 on 30 and it was bad like once I finally got up there there's a good chance somebody didn't walk away from that but I was like if I had left five minutes earlier that could have been you would I have been involved in this it's true or would it not have happened I mean you don't yeah, know or maybe it's the whole butterfly effect like maybe it wouldn't have happened or maybe it would have and I would have been involved so it's so weird but I will say Mary Jo's mom before she went to Martha's Vineyard her mom said oh honey just be careful of the water mm. and Mary Jo said oh mom you know I just like to sunbathe I don't even swim <sighs> well yeah I mean she kind of that's that's true yeah, she, she didn't been. End, she didn't end up swimming nope well, also in attendance at the party were, of course, Senator Ted Kennedy, his cousin, Joseph Garrigan, former Massachusetts U.S. Attorney, Paul F. Markham, Kennedy advisor, Charles Treder, Raymond LaRosa, and John B. Crimmins, Kennedy's part-time driver. With the exception of Crimmins, all the men were married and much older than the women. Apparently, Ted told everybody to leave their wives home, and he invited more people. And when he told some of the guys that, they were like, yeah, we're not going to go. Oh. so Or they're more like, yeah, we can't go. <laughs> Probably. Our <laughs> wife said no. We'd love to go, but, but no the old thanks. ball and chain isn't going to allow it. Yeah, they did say that they love to party, and like Mary Jo loved to party, but that her ex-boyfriend described her as straight as an arrow, the straightest arrow you'll ever see, because she went to his law school dance with him and she had to go to a different city to do that and when she got there she refused to sleep in his apartment she said you have to find me somewhere else to sleep i'm not that kind of girl Mm. and so she ended up staying with his landlady so you know this idea of like they're gonna go to this wild party and get all drunk and sleep with ted kennedy like she wasn't the type of person to do that yeah um but then i think kind of the maybe the cover-up or something kind of portrayed her yes yes she had traditional morals of that time yeah she was a good catholic girl what was expected of women yes yes. girl well here's where details start to become fuzzy and two different stories emerge so according to senator kennedy at approximately 11 15 p.m mary joe asked if he would drive her to the ferry so she could catch the last one for the night to edgar town where her hotel was located The last ferry left at midnight, and none would run again until the morning, making it impossible to leave the island until then. It's that old thing when you're trying to leave the party, you're like, do I go with this person, or am I going to get stuck here and sleep on a couch? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're also like, well, I know I've got a certain amount of time before Mm -hmm. that decision is going to be made for me. That's why I won't go somewhere where I'm going to be trapped. I hate being trapped (laughs) anywhere. Uh Uh-uh. At a party, anything like that. No. Take your own car. or That's like... This is a, okay, I'm sorry, this is a side story. I got, so like a funeral, right? You can't, 
like you're in a funeral you're you can't get up and leave the funeral right you shouldn't okay so i was at a funeral very recently (laughs) okay and it was in a crematorium chapel okay so like it's small and very echoey and like it's just uh, like where the little cremated like things on either side, where the little bucket of ashes go, the little boxes oh, go, and I don't you can think I've been to one like yeah, that. Yeah, you can buy like a little plot or like a little drawer, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I was sitting there, and my stomach made a grumble, Ooh. and I was like, okay, either I'm gonna shit my pants in this funeral <laughs> with this people that I only sort of tangentially knew, and I was like, oh, excuse me, excuse me. So I got up and I started walking down the hallways of this crematorium, and it is like marble oh god 20 foot it's ceilings clomp, clomp, and it's clomp, first of all clomp. it's very it's very loud second of all i'm going and there's no doors it's just wall to wall to wall uh-huh. of these little crematory like the ash you're gonna bucket. have to shit in an ash bucket and there's nothing like there's one plant and then i start i'm like <laughs> did you think no. about going in the plant well it started getting to that point <laughs> oh and so, no when I went out of the chapel, there were two doors, and I had gone to the right. So in my head, I'm like, shit, I should have gone to the left. So that means I have to walk across the back of the funeral. Oh, That's, no. by the way, still going on, and people are taking turns, like, praying and singing. Oh, God. <laughs> so the only bathroom is attached to the chapel, and it's so loud. And I go in there, and I was trying to, to be as quiet as I can, but it was, like, pretty explosive. And I was trying to be quiet, and then I was like, well, I can't flush it, because... First of all, that's not a real, it's not a great sound effect when someone's like, and now we lay our dear Aunt Martha to rest. Well, neither is. And now we lay our dear Aunt Martha to rest. <laughs> it was awful. So then, so I go, but I don't flush. And I was like, all right, I'm going oh to laugh. <laughs> this was my logistics at the time. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stand at the door. The panic you must have been feeling. I was sweating. I was drenched in sweat. <laughs> there was a, a guy at the back that I think maybe worked for the funeral home or maybe it was like a strange family member, but he was just sitting back there and kind of watching me. So I was just standing in the doorway and I was like, okay, when they go to like walk out with the bodies, it'll be everyone will, it's the body or like the ash bucket thing. And there was like a double funeral. It's a whole thing. Anyway. Good Lord. And so I was like, okay, when everyone gets up to leave, that's when I'm going to flush because I'll know like it'll be kind of a ruckus. Everyone gets up to leave and this mo- this relative makes a beeline and tries oh, to go God. in the bathroom. And I was like, no, you can't go. <laughs> She's like, were you waiting? And I was like, uh, yeah. And I just went in the bathroom. And then I flushed. Oh, no. It was awful. So I had to push a lady out of the... It was... I was that bad. That sounds like but a Seinfeld episode. It was a Seinfeld episode. I was so <laughs> trapped. But think about... Um, anyway, sorry. You know who else was trapped? Mary well, Joe Capecchi on this island. was in that... Oh, that, afterwards. That coffin, too. Go <laughs> Um, <laughs> and Mary Jo Gepeckney. This yes. poor lady. She she was stuck at a party with Ted Kennedy, who she hated. She called Office Boy, by the way. And apparently, she's asking him. Supposedly, should I say, she's asking him to take her back to her hotel. So they're headed. This is all according to Ted. This is Teddy's version. Teddy's version. So they're headed north on Chappaquiddick Road towards the ferry. Kennedy claims that he mistakenly took a wrong turn onto the unpaved, yes, it is called Dyke Road. There's a lot of strange names in this. Yeah. Just, uh, we're just going to all be aware that this is called Dyke Road, and then we're going to move on from it. I was going to say, what is that guy's name? Is Huck? Huck Luck? Huck. Yeah, and then there's another one there's, that's my favorite. There's a lot of names. To. We got a lot of names. So, they're so driving they on Dyke turn Road. So, they turn onto, and it's... It's relevant that it's unpaved because if you don't know where you're going, but all of a sudden the feeling of the street changes like underneath gravelly. you, you probably, that sends off a red flag. That like, oh, maybe I made a wrong turn. Mm-hmm. Well, not to him. Not if you're on crack or whatever. Yes. Yeah. He he's, uh, so he, and he says he's going approximately 20 miles per hour at this time. Unfamiliar with the road, he didn't realize the one lane wooden plank bridge crossing Poocha Pond, was quickly approaching. He then missed the entrance to Dyke Bridge and drove off the side and into the water. At the time, the bridge had no guardrail. And the pictures of this bridge, it's like a boardwalk. It's br- it's rickety. I don't think it could carry a car. I wouldn't even want to test it in, in, the, di- in the light. In the I don't even think I would want to walk across it, let alone drive a car across it, because there's literally like, there's like you know, like, um, no there's wooden uh, railroad ties. Mm-hmm. That's basically what is along the edge of it. That's how high the the guardrail... There's, like, no margin for error. No, no, not at all. It's a very 
dicey situation for anyone. And also, the city just lets it exist that way. I think now... I'm sure now. Now it has... But even now, like, the guardrails are not... It's not like highway guardrails. It's yeah. still like a wooden, wooden fence, Walk basically. the plank. Yes. Now, while Kennedy claims all this took place around 11.15 p.m., Deputy Sheriff Huck Look, which, my God, that's hard to say. What a name. Had a different account. At 12.45 a.m., Look was headed home for the night when he spotted a dark car parked at the end of Chappaquiddick Road. This would have been 90 minutes after Kennedy claims his car had already gone over the bridge. Thinking the driver was lost, Look got out of his car and approached. As he yelled to the passengers to see if they needed help, the car quickly sped off down Dyke Road towards the bridge. Interesting. Very what Kennedy. a great what a great sheriff he just screams hey y'all need anything yeah and they oh away. so and he's like well they're gone so i watched um the i think it came out just within the past year or so the movie chappaquiddick i think 2017 yeah um kate mar is in it she plays mary Jo Kopechny. ed helms is in it andy and bernard. plays yes andy bernard is in it he plays uh the cousin joe i didn't recognize the the main guy the main guy i forget what else he's been in Jason Clark, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. um, it was good. And it was a pretty accurate account of everything. They didn't really take a lot of liberties. Yeah, people said it follows the most, like, the famous book pretty well. Yeah. Um, and when this happens, the deputy literally just gets out of his car and starts walking down the road. He's like, hey, you guys lost? And then the car just speeds <laughs> off. And then he's like, guess I'll go home. He doesn't, like, <laughs> even well, though he knew where that... He knew that br that road led to this bridge, which essentially led to Death. a beach and that went nowhere. Mm -hmm. He was like, eh, I'm, I guess they'll figure it out. Hey, man, live and let live. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. So Kennedy claims that he was never parked on the road or saw the sheriff. However, the next morning, when Look was called to the scene of the accident, he recognized the car in the water as being the same one he had seen the night before. The car had landed in the water upside down, splintering the windshield. Kennedy somehow managed to escape and swim to the surface. He claims that he called Mary Jo's name several times, and when he did not see her, he dove back down seven or eight times to try and save her, but was unsuccessful. He then swam to the shore, where he rested for 15 minutes before walking back to the cottage where the party was still going on. I don't Is mean this to, a time for a rest? I don't mean to sound like a naysayer. And maybe the adrenaline of having just driven your car off of a bridge would give you superhuman strength. But he was in a plane crash, and it was well known right. that he had to wear a back brace and had really bad back pain. Yeah. So, like, really? He could yeah. dive down seven or eight times? Also, how did he get out of the car and couldn't get back That's into the car? That's exactly what I was wondering when I was watching this film. Or did I'm he like, ditch out before I'm like, it went if over? he... If he, if his window was down and he swam out. Swim back in. Swim back in. Or unless he like managed to open the car door and it slammed shut and then he couldn't get it open. Just go back in the fucking door you came out of. Yeah. If if the door had shut and then it's in the water, you can't really open yeah, it. Yeah. Then really that makes hard. sense. But I mean, that's something. How that's did the door detail. get open though? Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if he managed to open down. it. Yeah. Who knows? These are all details that you'd think he would have remembered and. And explain to the public. No, he's shit hammered drunk. But he, all these things, no one will ever know. Well, according to him, he was not, but definitely he was. Sure, sure, sure. During his walk back to the cottage, Kennedy claims he did not see any houses along the way where he thought he could stop and ask for help. However, the walk back would have taken him past four different houses where this would have been a possibility. The first of the houses, referred to as Dyke House, probably could rename that well it's the road yeah <laughs> was rename the road was 150 yards away from the bridge sylvia mom who lived at the house said later that she was home she had a phone and she had left the porch light on that night when she went to bed here's the thing too ted kennedy wasn't like a superstar famous but he was famous enough especially in oh the, they would have definitely in the northeast him, also sure. just the way he looked and sounded sort of like a kennedy if he would have knocked on the door and was like ah there's been a crash oh they would have known who they would have let him 100%. in 100 absolutely they i mean if in. ted cruz knocks first of all if ted cruz knocks on my door he can get fucked <laughs> He can go eat a dick and <laughs> hey, I, I will hey, not help him. I would be right or what he needs. No, because he's going to use your body as nutrients.
nutrients so he can fuel his spaceship back to the planet God knows where he's from. Or he'll just, it'll be like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and he'll just use my, wear my skin. I don't want to get political here, but Ted Cruz is a dick who's very harmful to everyone yes. in the world. Yes. And we just reelected him. <laughs> and by Thanks we, so I mean not Heather or I, no, or I mean. hopefully anybody that we know. God. If, but if you did, tell me why. Because first of all, I'd love to hear it. But also, oh, man. don't ever do that again. <laughs> yeah. Whew. 2020, you guys. That's that's what we're going to look forward to now. Yeah, this whole month is pretty political. Yeah. It's bringing yeah, a lot of stuff yeah. up for me. Oh, yeah. Definitely. All right. So he ignores that house. Also, in uh, one of the uh, things I was researching, they said this guy that was a kid, and he said that he grew up in one of the other four houses, and that he, from a, he was like four years old at the time, and from age three to age seven, he slept with his bedroom light on every night because he was like afraid of the dark, and his bedroom faced that road. So, like, the yeah. light would have been on in his also, bedroom. Also, even if there are no lights, who cares? Someone's dying. Just knock on the door, bang on the door. Anyone in their right mind that was trying to get help would have done that. Because even if he knocks on the door, but it was the 60s, they probably would have just let him in. If someone knocked on the door and said, hey, there'd been a car accident, I'm like, you ain't coming in, but I'll call the cops for yeah. you. Yeah, and if you see it's, like, a political figure, which you clearly recognize, and he's dripping wet, you're yeah. probably going to let him in. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, well, I mean, it makes sense because he didn't want it reported. That's well, why you wouldn't stop, for right, sure. Right, exactly. The motivation here is yes. cover up. Exactly. Well, once back at the party. Oh, Kennedy, he went back to the party. He Great. went back to the party. He walked all the way back to the cottage where the party was going on and discreetly summons his cousin Joe and Paul Markham and told them what had happened. So oh, no this, one else knew what was going on. It was like, how discreetly he was wet. Well, in the movie, and I do think this is actually what happened, he, so he gets back to the party, he, like, slips into the back seat of this car that's parked next oh. to the kind of patio, and one of the guys comes outside to smoke, and he's like, hey, man. he's like, go get Joe, and they're like... Joey will take care yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, Joey was kind of known as the, he'll take care of everything, he was kind of the... Uh, not the scapegoat, but kind of just like kind of their kind of their bitch, the family fixer kind of guy too. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't. I believe the Kennedys actually adopted him. I'm not sure if in the movie he he talks about how his parents both died when he was young. Okay, so they adopted him. So he was kind of like brothers to them. Uh, okay, a, br a brother to them. So he tells Paul and Joe what happened, and then all three of them drive back down to the bridge. Gargan and Markham both get in the water to try and rescue Mary Jo, but were unable to open any of the doors or bust out the windows. So timing-wise, according to Ted Kennedy, mm -hmm. so let's say he has to walk 30 or 45 minutes. If that. If yeah. that. 30 minutes. And he gets, so then she's in the water, he's trying to save her, 15 minutes to shore, so that's 30 minutes, then another 30 minute walk back, so now she's been in the car for an hour. And she's then still alive. She's still alive. Yeah. And then they get they go back over there and can't open the thing. There's no way she's alive when she, they're trying to get her out. Allegedly. Allegedly. Prob and according to the medical examiner, she was. I think she was alive, but were they trying to get her out? That's yes. That's, so they say, we "Oh, we went back and we tried and we couldn't do anything." I'm like, "Bullshit!" Because if you were there while she was still alive, you could have been like, "Swim down and come back up." Because I think they said that you could get like uh, disoriented in the darkness, mm -hmm. and, and she may have thought she was swimming up to get out when, in fact, because the car was upside down, she was swimming like towards the wheel well, uh, and so she wouldn't have known to go down to get out. Well, in the movie. Andy Bernard is trying to swim down to get her. Do -do. And he keeps saying like, do -do -do -do. it's too, it's too dark. I can't see anything. Yeah. So I don't know if he, they ever even like, even if they were trying to help her, I don't know if they ever made contact with her. Yeah. The other guy, Paul Markham in the movie has a bum knee and mm. he essentially just sits on the car that's submerged. Oh, while, cool. Sink it further. Well, Andy Bernard, yeah, well, just keeps diving down so to nice. To help out. While Kennedy is just laying on the bridge this he's whole like, time. Oh, man. Yeah, he's like, oh, what the fuck have I gotten myself I'm into? I'm real bummed. Yeah. Well, after several failed attempts, Gargan and Markham claimed that they drove Kennedy back to the ferry landing where there was a public phone booth. Both men alleged they told a now hysterical Kennedy that he had to report the accident. Supposedly, Kennedy promised he would. However, instead of calling the police right there and then, 
he dove back into the water and swam 500 feet across the channel to Edgartown. Why? He's bizarre. I Why? Don't know. I, that makes Someone, zero sense to me. I was going to say, and some people have said, like, yeah, kids could swim across it, that it's not that hard of a swim. But if you were just in a wreck, plus you have a bad back from a plane accident, is this really something that you're going to be able to endure? I don't know. It's very bizarre. Well, Gargan and Markham headed back to the party to do damage control. They later stated they thought Ted was going to report the incident when he arrived at Edgartown, so they didn't bother reporting it themselves. Oh, come on. Also, that's a lie. I feel like... The, I feel like Which Maury, part? I feel like Maury. That's a lie. <laughs> I feel like that they didn't... If Joey was the fixer of the family, they weren't going to go call the cops on a Kennedy. Mm-mm. That's like their whole livelihood is working for this family. They're not going to whistleblow no, on a family. No, I think they all made a pact right there that... We'll deal with this we in the morning. We'll see how this plays out. Because there was argument of, well, we should just say that she drove off on her own and that you were never even in the car and she must have just crashed on her own. And uh, they're like, no, people at this time when they were trying to get the body, apparently they, they felt like someone saw them mm-hmm. and they were worried like, no, people saw us. They're going to report it. Yeah. Well, interesting you you say that. While Kennedy claims he swam across the channel back to the mainland, C. Remington Ballou has always wondered if that's what really happened. Ballou and his family had been on their boat, which was close to the ferry, around 2 a.m. the night in question. He told the New Bedford Standard Times he saw a small boat carrying three people turn off its lights and motor and then drift towards a larger boat that had crossed the channel. The bigger boat then also turned off its lights. A few minutes later, the small boat started its engine back and sailed out of the harbor. Hmm. Kennedy's press aide, here we go, Dick Drain, that is his name. (laughs) That is his name. Somebody they were interviewing on one of the podcasts' name was Dick Tool. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, I texted Austin Guttery and I was just like, this is a real name, Dick Tool. Dick Drain is... Dick Drain is even better than Dick If your last name is Drain... Do not name your kid Richard. Go by Richie. Go by Rich. Yeah, and if you want, if Richard is something you're dead set on, don't go by Dick. Back in the day, though, there were dicks all around. (laughs) I mean, there still are. Same. (laughs) It was, that was like a popular name. Yeah. We had no dicks in my family, but Mm, not by name. Yeah. Uh, By name, I don't think we do in mine either. Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Well, you know what? Let's bring Dick back. (laughs) Bring it back. No one... I've been trying do you, to. I, I do know Richards. I do know like one or two. I think they, I, not, my they do not go by Dick. You say my cousin's name Richard, and he goes by Richard. Yes, the uh, whole as name. One should. The whole name. Well, Dick Drain said that what Baloo saw had absolutely nothing to do with the senator, but Baloo has always wondered whether they were somehow connected to the accident. Yeah, maybe they were. That's how he got back instead of swimming all the way back. Well, in so. the movie. That is how he they d- depict him getting back. Is on a boat? On a small boat? They're on like a, yeah, like a like tiny a, little boat like you a would dinghy? have little paddles for. They're at the payphone. Dick Drain said there was no dinghy. <laughs> they're at the payphone, and instead of using the fucking payphone there, Kennedy like goes over and just unties this little kayak and they're all like whose boat is that and, and he's like i don't know and they he's just like, catch get... you later bitches <laughs> well and the other two jump in and help him paddle across oh, God. to edgar town he gets out and the other two paddle it back God. so yeah they, they get back to the party all that. sweaty and insane and the girls are like where have you guys been oh we're jerking each other off yeah outside. they they did not tell the girls when they got back what was going on mm-hmm. or even any of the other men mm-hmm. they said and then people were like well where are ted and mary joe and they're like Oh, they probably went back to their hotel. Yeah, they and, were tired. Who knows? Yeah, and they'd be like, uh, if they asked any more questions, they're like, just go to bed. Just go to bed. Mm, don't worry about it. Also, suspiciously, while Kennedy claims that Mary Jo asked for him to take her back to her hotel, her purse and hotel room key were later found at the cottage. And someone else's pocketbook, as they kept calling it, mm. and how my Tennessee relatives call it, yes. someone else's pocketbook was in the car with Mary Jo. Interesting. Simple explanation. She grabs a purse. It's not hers. Accidentally grabs a purse and jumps in the car because they're trying to leave and make okay, the ferry. sure. Nefarious explanation is Ted and the other woman were in the car. Mary Jo was asleep in the back. They didn't know. They crashed the car. They leave her. There's so many theories. There's a lot of conspiracy theories with with this one. And also just with me. And Heather has her own, I'm sure. Yes. 
Well, when Kennedy, however he arrived back at Edgartown, he did not report the accident. All right. Instead, he went back to his hotel room, changed into dry clothes, and laid down. At 2.55 a.m., he complained to the hotel owner that he had been awakened by a noisy party. People think that he did this as to an alibi. As, stamp, yeah. as an alibi, so the owner can be like, yeah, this dick came and knocked on my door. Yeah. It was rude. I agree with that. Meanwhile, Mary Jo was most likely gasping for her last breaths while trapped in a car fully submerged in water. Horrifying. What a terrible way to what die. A, I got, they I said told it took, you, what, three got, to four hours? Yes. I got very emotional during this scene in the movie because it, she's yeah, just that trapped in this fully submerged car with an air pocket. Just like, you know, you're going to die. It's just, you can't get out. She's screaming, Ted, Ted, trying to get out. You can't. And now in everything, since I'm a parent, I just imagine if that was Ella. Yeah. And I'm like, if these, this was my daughter's last moments, my God. That's I feel like you would. So you're just racked with fear and there's nothing you can, you're like, well, I just got to wait for this to happen. Death is coming. Pray to, yeah. pray to whoever. Yeah. At 8 a.m. the next morning. Gargan and Markham found Kennedy at his hotel, having breakfast with some friends and acting as if nothing was wrong. He's like, ah, what a wild night last night. Mm -hmm. It was a fun party. He still had not reported anything to the police. Okay, buddy. The three men then took the ferry back to the island where Kennedy used the payphone that they had just been standing beside hours before. However, he still did not call the cops. Instead, he made a series of calls to his lawyers, friends, and father. Yeah, they said he called the Kennedy compound and then the speechwriter and advisor mm -hmm. to JFK and then a lawyer and then back to the compound. and Basically everyone but the police. Pretty much. And the big conspiracy cover-up was that they tried to, uh, newspapers and uh, police officers tried to get the payphone records to see, like, who he mm. called and what order. And the pay the phone company interestingly would only release like so many numbers like oh. they would say oh these are the only numbers that were available everyone's so. in their pocket for real a team of advisors including robert Sorensen and ted mcnamara which had been very influential in jfk's presidency yep. soon arrived to help him get out of the mess he'd created around the same time kennedy was casually enjoying breakfast a fisherman and his young son discovered kennedy's car in the water with Mary Jo's body still inside. They ran to the nearest house, Dyke House, and the police were called. They did so, the right thing. Yes, they, they found the body around 8 a.m. By 8.20, the police were called. So that's how quickly he could have also got help. Yeah, if response he had gone. time. Yes. Especially at nighttime, it probably would have been faster. There's not other crimes or anything yeah. going on. Once the police arrived, they realized a diver would be needed, so they called one in to further assist. John Farrer... Captain of the Edgartown Fire Rescue Unit arrived with gear and within 10 minutes had recovered Mary Jo's body. Wow. Far and, he, and he said he was always on the ready. So if they would have called him the night before, he's like, it would have yeah. been no problem. It would have been the same amount of time. He said he found her body in the well of the back seat of the overturned submerged car. Rigor mortis had set in. Her hands were clasping the back seat and her face was turned upward most likely to where an air pocket would have been. He believed that based on all of this, Mary Jo suffocated rather than drowned. He also stated that she was most likely alive for three to four hours and would have probably survived if a more timely rescue attempt had been conducted. Here's where there's a couple of varying accounts because several uh, law enforcement officers who were there when they pulled the body out of the car, so one guy said it was the worst thing I've ever seen. Sorry, guys, it's about to get pretty graphic. Uh, he's like, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. When they pulled her body out, they pushed down on her stomach and water just poured out of her face. It mm -hmm. poured out of her nose and mouth. But the medical examiner and other people said, no, that that's she didn't drown, that there was just a minimal amount of water like in her mouth, like she had suffocated before that. So that's Is the it question. one of those things where you have that false memory because you think that's what it would have looked yes. like. And the guy's like, I w that's the first drowned body I ever saw. So I would never forget it. But here's the thing about uh, human beings and their memories. They suck ass yeah. and you can't really rely on anything you remember. Yes. That's we why talked, I think in one of the first episodes about how 
false memories. When you remember something, you're just remembering the last time you remembered it. That is correct. And that's why I write a lot of stuff down in my diary because I'm like, oh, that happened, you know, later on. So even I'll be like, something will happen or even a, this happens all the time with like milestones with Ella. I'll be like, oh, there's no way that I'll forget when the day this happened because she waved for the first time or something. And then I'll just decide later to write it down in the baby book. By the next day, I'm like, what? Yeah, when, I can't remember this happened. Well, you just, yeah. life gets in the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean. So this guy's like, no, I, for, I, I completely remember they pulled the body out and this and this happened. And then another person says, I remember with perfect clarity when they pulled the body out, no water came out of yeah. it. Yeah. So it's just like, who do you believe? Yeah. They're both law enforcement they officers. They both probably think they are 100% they right. They are right. Too. And the question is, is one, is the water guy trying to support the Kennedy theory of, oh, the car went in the water, she immediately drowned and there was nothing we could have done versus the truth where she suffocated yeah. because she was up in the wheel well holding. They said that her fingernails were broken and striated oh, from trying to claw up higher towards that's more so and more air. So that's horrific. I think that's the more likely scenario that yeah. she suffocated in that air yeah. pocket. Well, later at the inquest into Mary Jo's death, Farrer would testify that it looked as if she were holding herself up to get a last breath of air. It was a consciously assumed position. She didn't drown. She died of suffocation in her own air void. It took her at least three or four hours to die. I could have had her out of that car 25 minutes after I got the call, but he, Ted Kennedy, didn't call. Man. Stuff like that where it's like, your own ass... Or embarrassment is not... And also, you crashed a car. You saved a person's life. That actually looks better than what happened of you trying to cover it up. When you've grown up in this family, though, that tries to cover anything possibly scandalous up, you're a senator, you're married... You're with a blonde hair girl. You're with, yeah, a much younger girl. You've been drinking, probably doing drugs... There's just so much... that, And then... So then you're also just not thinking clearly. That's true. That's true. It's just like self-preservation. Exactly. Well, after Farrer had recovered the body, the police ran the car's license plate and discovered it was registered to Ted Kennedy. You know, they probably looked at each other like, whoop. What? Wait a minute. Yeah. And everyone collectively, their buttholes just clenched because they're like, like, what do we do? We can't actually investigate this. Yeah. Kennedy, while this was going on, was still at the payphone when he learned the police had discovered his car and Mary Jo's body. God. He and Markham then headed back to Edgartown to the police station so he can probably try and save some face. Yeah. While his cousin Joe returned to the cottage to tell the other boiler room girls what had happened. If this tells you a little bit about the Kennedy personality, they said that he shows up to the police station and the the uh, sheriff is out uh, at the scene of the accident or whatever and comes back and goes into his office and behind his desk using his phone mm-hmm. with his feet up on his desk is Ted Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> This is, in the movie, that's what happens. Oh, did they have it in the movie? Yeah, he and Markham walk into the sheriff's station, and his sec- the sheriff's secretary is like, he's not here, and they're just like... Who gives a shit? We're gonna, we'll be in here, and just go in, and they're like, sh- he, she's like, that's his private office, and they're like, bye. Shut up, bitch. Yeah, I mean, it's like, he yeah, just thought really he was happen. above, the, literally above the law. Yeah, they do whatever they want to do. So once back at the police station, Kennedy made a few more calls, and then issued this statement. On July 18th, 1969, at approximately 11.15 p.m. in Chappaquiddick, Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> Massachusetts, I was driving my car on Main Street on my way to get to the ferry back to Edgartown. I was unfamiliar with the road and turned right onto Dyke Road instead of bearing a hard left on Main Street. After proceeding approximately one half mile on Dyke Road, I descended a hill and came upon a narrow bridge. The car went off the side of the bridge. There was one passenger with me. One, Miss Mary, a former secretary, my brother, Senator Robert Kennedy. The car turned over and sank into the water and landed with the roof resting on the bottom. I attempted to open the car door and the window, but I have no recollection of how I got out of the car. I came to the surface and then repeatedly drove down to the car to attempt to see if the passenger was still in the car. I was unsuccessful in this attempt. I was exhausted and in a state of shock. I recall walking back to where my friends were eating. There was a car parked in front of the cottage, and I climbed into the back seat. I then asked for someone to bring me back to Edgartown. I remember walking around for a period and going back to my hotel room. When I fully realized what happened in the morning, I immediately contacted the police. 
And that's exactly how it went. And also, if you listen to the recording, very spot on impression. <laughs> very spot on. I got to update my LinkedIn uh, <laughs> accreditation. Absolutely, yes. Spot on Kennedy impression. <laughs> so that's issued. Then on July 25th, 1969, seven days after the accident, Kennedy pleaded guilty to the charge of leaving the scene of an accident causing bodily injury. Kennedy's attorney, as well as the prosecutors... Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> ...agreed that his sentence should be suspended due to his age. Okay, he was 37. He's not that old. I don't even understand why that came into play. He might die before the sentence. Exactly. His character... Well... ...and prior reputation. Eh. If we're going to take all those things into consideration, then book his ass. <laughs> <laughs> they, they totally missed the mark there. Put this bitch in jail. The judge agreed with them and suspended his two-month jail sentence. So he essentially just walked walked out of there with a slap on the wrist. God. In announcing the sentence, Judge James Boyle referred to Kennedy's unblemished record and said that he, quote, has already been and will continue to be punished far beyond anything this court can impose. Oh, his sadness is enough of a punishment. Do we, exactly. Let's say that about all criminals. Yes. They I, feel very bad. Can you imagine any this being anyone else and, and this being the outcome? I mean, if you're a celebrity. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, pretty much. I mean, just a normal person, which is no. what most people are. No. Yeah. Well, later that evening, Kennedy made a televised statement about the accident in which he said things like... Only reasons of health have prevented my wife from accompanying me to the regatta. There's no truth whatever to the widely circum circ circumcised, nope, <laughs> the widely circulated suspicions of immoral conduct regarding my behavior. I was not driving under the influence of liquor. My conduct during the hours immediately after the accident makes no sense to me at all. My doctor informed me I su suffered a cerebral concussion and shock, but I'm not trying to use this medical condition to escape responsibility. I have... All kinds of scrambled thoughts, like the scrambled eggs I ate the next morning immediately. <laughs> it went through my mind after the accident. I wondered whether the girl might still be alive somewhere out in that immediate area, whether some awful curse actually do, does hang over our family, whether it was some justifiable reason for me to doubt what had happened and delay my report, whether somehow the awful weight of this incredible incident might in some way pass through my shoulders. For him. Do you think I should resign? Because I'm not, bitches. <laughs> no, no. Not only are you not... But everyone was heavily in favor of him remaining in office. And in 1970, he was re-elected. Hell yeah. I feel like this is what just happened. I'm going all the way to the top. <laughs> well, almost. But in 1979, Kennedy announced his candidacy for presidency, but lost the Democratic nomination to incumbent Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter's like, I'm just a peanut farmer and I haven't killed any women <laughs> that you know of. Well, he also lost in a landslide to Reagan. Well... But the Chappaquiddick incident was thought to have been a major catalyst for Kennedy losing. You kill one girl and suddenly I can't be president. Yeah, imagine that. It's interesting to think if this happened now, how differently this would be. First of all, they handled. could probably track the whole night with their cell phones. Oh, yeah. There'd be pictures. There'd be Snapchats. Even if there weren't, there'd probably be private texts. There would be pings of cell phones to know if she really was there or wasn't yeah. there. And man, yeah, that'd it's, be a lot different. Oh, yes. And again, that's like technology. I think that's what's wrong, just to take a little slap, a political diversion. I think that's what's wrong with Donald Trump is that he's so stupid and he tries to do stuff that they would have done in the 60s. But there are like video cameras <laughs> and computers. That's a very good point. It's like he, he's trying, like, well, you know, uh, Acosta hit that girl in her face whenever she tried mm -hmm. to take the microphone away. It's like, well, there's like 17 different cameras and yeah. we can like see that well, that's not what he, happened. He, yeah, he, He'll say like, I never made fun of a handicapped person. And they, there's a video like, of Donald, him immediately making fun of It was on a nationally broadcast uh, thing. Yeah. Everyone saw it. Like you could do crazy stuff probably back in the day and there would be no video of it yeah. or, you know, footage. And now it's like we have, a, it's on Twitter. Well, that's <laughs> we when he, he was peaking. So I think he just wants to live in his bubble that everything is still in like the 60s and 70s. I guess that's true. Oh, God. When when will he die? <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably on a list now for saying something. Like that. I mean, I'm fine. I'm already. I was already on a list. We're on the list already. Yeah, I'm on a lot of lists. Where are, where, what is the um, the suspicious or suppressive person? <laughs> I'm definitely on that list. A couple of SPs. I've, oh yeah. So I'll I'll the side note. I'll put it on our Instagram. But when I came out of uh, teaching at DCH last night, so we've talked before how there's a 
uh, Scientology Center down in Deep Ellum. Just a couple blocks away. Just a couple blocks away from the comedy club where we always perform. And they are now targeting people because there was a little pamphlet on my windshield with handwritten times of when I should come by to do my personality test. Come on by. Mm-hmm. Let's never. do it. Let's do it as a mini so. Oh, man. Christy goes, becomes a Scientologist. We're never, we're never going to get them to stop calling us That's if true. we go. We gotta t- you got to take a burner phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, the poor Kopechny family has kind <sighs> of been lost during this entire thing. And Mary Jo, the headline said, Ted and Blonde Secretary yeah. in Accident. She can't we- even be given a name. No. Another thing, interestingly... That was going on the same weekend that helped Kennedy because it gave them time to uh, kind of divert attention and come up with different stories was the Apollo 11. Oh, perfect. (laughs) Yeah. So JFK's like biggest thing he wanted to happen during his presidency is coming to fruition while his fat, dumb brother is just (laughs) fucking everything up once again. Like, pay no attention to me. Look up at the sky. Yeah. There's a spaceship. Yes. Well, the medical examiner ruled Mary Jo's death as an accidental drowning, and no autopsy was performed. However, two months later, on September 18th, District Attorney Edmund Dennis attempted to... If you guys just heard that, Heather just gave a huge smooch to Lucy. I'm sorry. I love this dog so much. (laughs) Edmund Dennis attempted to secure an exhumation of Mary Jo's body to perform a belated autopsy. Citing blood found on Kopechny's long sleeve blouse and in her mouth and nose, which may or may not be consistent with death by drowning. The discovery of the blood was made when her clothes were given to authorities by the funeral director. This is some of the conspiracy stuff, too, comes in where supposedly Richard Nixon hated the Kennedys and they were like the bane of his existence. And when this shit started going down, the guy who later would be like the Watergate guy was was like his personal like spy, pretty much, Mm -hmm. or like personal PI sent him out there. And they said that like stuff like her pocketbook, this guy in a blue suit showed up and was like, I work with the government. Give me that. And they're like, oh, okay. And he just walked off with it. To the cops? To the cops, yeah. Wow. And, like, he would go in and, like, basically was trying to trying to find ways to make it look worse or whatever. Like, So you think that the blood may have been planted? I mean, I don't know. I think it could have been caused by... Like, a car if, accident. Yeah, I mean, I mean anything like, happening in a car. And the windshield was destroyed. So if she'd hit that, perhaps. Um, Back then, nobody wore seatbelts. It no. was a free-for-all. Exactly. Well, Mary Jo's parents opposed this request. There had been rumors that their daughter might have been pregnant, and they felt that the only reason they wanted to perform an autopsy was to confirm or deny this. So they're looking out for her of, like, a possible other scandal. Like, reputational. Yeah, and her daughter, in in death, her name's going to be dragged through the mud even more than already And before she went to, she was dating a foreign service officer, and they were getting serious, and he kept wanting to get engaged, and she kept saying no, because she wanted to work on her career. And then a couple weeks before this, she had called her parents and was like, I got to tell you three big things. And they're like, what's that? And she's like, I decided to work with this political consultant, so I'm going to start a new job. And me and the foreign service officer decided to get engaged, and then something came up. Her dad got on the phone to say hi to say hi and, and then she never said the they third got distracted thing. and she never said the third thing so maybe <laughs> she was pregnant oh, or maybe not maybe yeah. she i don't know she was like ted kennedy's been stealing money <laughs> or maybe maybe her i mean by all accounts her and ted weren't having an affair but no. maybe they were they said, and she no, was pregnant the, with his baby they said she hated him like she didn't have any respect for him all she loved rfk and basically was like why weren't you the one that got killed yeah and the same with kind of all the boiler room girls but they all went through that together bobby's death together she was at the hotel the night that bobby died and so and you know at the funeral knew his wife and was friends with his friends super close to his wife she was in the car with them like leaving the funeral like she was like family Mm -hmm. so even though she it's like your best friend dies and his little brother's a piece of shit but you're like i just miss bobby and like he does too like i get it i can kind of be close to yeah i don't I don't love you. I don't, but you know, it's fine. Um, and then Bobby or not Bobby, Ted Kennedy had this like years long relationship with this lady named Helga that was like more, it wasn't just a sexual relationship. Like she will never confirm or deny it, but like by all accounts, this was like his best friend and love of his life is this Mm. lady named Helga who lived in New York and like did a bunch of fundraisers for him. So to me, I don't think he and Mary Jo were like romantically involved at all. I think she, you know, they were united by Bobby's death and then they each individually. Had Which their... makes it even more ridiculous that he wouldn't have reported it when it happened. Yeah, or helped her, you know. If that's what he's worried about. Yeah. Well, a judge upheld the parent's request and the body was not exhumed. 
Years later, Mary Jo's mother said that not having this autopsy performed was the biggest mistake of her life. I bet because you just always wonder. Yeah. At the time, it was raw. And two, they were... The, the and Kennedy, you're just grieving and you're just not thinking Well, clearly. when they were grieving, all these Kennedy handlers came to their house and was like, we don't want you to go through anything. We don't want you to stress. We're going to have somebody answer your phone, answer the door. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. And later on, people said... They were screening. They didn't want. Oh yeah. They didn't want newspapers coming and nosy people to come and get information from the Capegnies. So then they didn't get a chance to talk to Ted. It was kind of like, oh, let this all blow over. Ted will come and talk to you. You'll get the real story. So then a couple months later, they get this invitation to go to Ted's house. They show up to Ted's house. It's like a full out cocktail party. So they think they're going to show up and get information. They show up and it's a party. Well, then they're video, not video, they're photographed at this party. And then the headlines are Mary Jo Kopechny's family and the Kennedys are super close. They've forgiven him. He's fine. It was like a Kennedy trick basically to make Ted Kennedy not look like a douchebag. Like, like, oh, look, her family forgave him. So he must be fine. So not only did these people lose their daughter, but they were robbed of their grieving process. They have no idea what the last hours of her life is like. And they weren't allowed to like grieve with friends mm-hmm. or other family in the movie they do have a ha- one of the uh kennedy aides essentially goes over to the parents house and someone knocks on the one of the neighbors knocks on the door to, like bring a casserole and the aides like oh i'll get it you don't need to get up and won't let the neighbors come in and talk to them or anything they so, isolated them yeah it's so sad oh god well the Capegni family did not bring any legal action against kennedy but did receive a payment of $90,904 from him personally, odd amount, and 50000 from his insurance company. Do you know what that 90000 amount was for? No. They calculated her future earnings. Oh, that's right. They only, but so for when you, when someone dies and you sue for wrongful death, you can sue for lots of stuff. So if you're married, you can sue for uh, loss of consortium. So that's like the pleasure of having a spouse of like helping you take care of your kid and mm-hmm. having sex with you and watching TV. And that has a value on it. And then also you can have, uh, you can get um, future earnings uh, and then just like the other members of the family can like recover. So the fact that they're like, well, she probably would have made this much money. Here you go. I mean, really? When we, I've talked before how I served on that jury for the wrongful oh, yeah. death case for the infant. And that was something we had to decide in the earnings was on several different counts, like um, how much the father was going to be awarded, how much his mother was going to be mm-hmm. awarded. Um, That's And wanna... we basically calculated he was, I think, 10 months when it happened or eight months. We basically assigned a value to what he probably would have lived mm-hmm. to be. Um I mean, we awarded that them like $62 million. It was a crazy amount. But like, because we were like, well, he was a baby. True. He He could have been Bill Gates. Yeah. You know, you never know like what his life would have looked like. But my point is. I don't want to break your heart, but they appealed that and probably didn't get. Oh, they didn't. We knew they weren't going to get it after we, they got that because she didn't have insurance. Oh, good. The daycare. We didn't know that at the time though. Um, However, I think it sends a message. Oh, yeah. But also, my point is, no matter how much money you're given, your kid is still dead. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. No amount of money. There's no amount of money that's going to change how you feel about that. Well, the Kopechnys later explained their decision not to take legal action by saying, we figured that people would think we were looking for blood money. They also gave half of the settlement they got to their church. So sad. Mary Jo's parents ended up using the money they had been saving for her wedding to pay for her funeral. That's so sad. That is so heartbreaking. God. I can't. That's something you can't even think about for too long. Well, we've talked kind of about some other theories that people have about what might have happened that night. Some think when Kennedy spotted the sheriff, he got out of the car and walked back to the party fearing what it would look like if he was caught with Mary Jo. Supposedly, Mary Jo then would have tried to drive his car back, but being unfamiliar with the area, not used to driving a larger car, and having had a few drinks, gets lost and runs off the bridge. They I, did, don't, I don't think this well, is Well, I was going to say, I don't think that's true, but they did say that she was not a big drinker, and if even like three drinks, she would have been wasted, because she just never drank. Yeah. Where, on the other hand, I can drink about two bottles of wine, and I'm fine. <laughs> I can go through a six-pack pretty quickly but Luke, i've seen i've seen it and you've seen me <laughs> yes yes, yes. Yeah. we are right. we're pretty good we are right. uh another theory and this is the one you i think this mentioned one earlier. this one i think is more likely 
So Kennedy and another woman from the party had actually left together. And unbeknownst to them, Mary Jo was asleep in the back seat of the car. See, and that's, and even if it was not Kennedy and another woman, if it was just him by himself, they said that, again, Mary Jo only had a few drinks, but she never drank and got shit faced and she had stomach problems and that she would not be the type of person that would be like, take me back. I want to go back that she would just be like, well, I'll just go and like go to sleep and I'll, I don't want to bother anybody. They said she was really trying to be really accommodating. So what if Kennedy was going to try to drive back and Mary Jo was asleep in the back seat and he really did just drive off the bridge and didn't even know she was back there. Mm, maybe. I, I think he knew she was in the car. Yeah. But to that point though, to this theory, a lot of people that support this say this would make sense with the lack of injury she had mm-hmm. on her face and, and head because she would have the, the windshield was yeah. But he also didn't have injuries. True. That's true. He claims in the piece of shit he was, he wore a neck brace to her funeral. Well, I mean, you know, he's to, injured. And he, in and in the movie, he shows him putting it on, and his cousin comes in. And he's like, "What are you doing?" His cousin is the only one in the movie. That seems to realize what a piece of shit it's kind of he bullshit, is and yeah. that he's lying to everyone and trying to gain sympathy. And he's basically saying, what do you think? You think I'll get sympathy from my constituents if I wear this? He's like, no, it looks fake. Take it off. You're, you're, like an, you're asshole. an asshole. And he ends up wearing it anyways. Well, and they said that uh, um, this caused Ted's wife to really start drinking a lot more. She had a miscarriage five days after it happened due to the stress. Sure. She started drinking. She was a flat out like pissed drunk alcoholic for the rest of her life after this and that also joe kennedy when ted told him about it stopped eating and died four months later and ted's big thing was always like i killed my dad i killed my dad i was a disappointment well, i killed my dad wrong. i mean he might not be wrong in the movie he his father is very mean to him <laughs> it's kind of funny <laughs> well i mean he deserves a little bit yeah 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 but i mean we know joe kennedy's a dick um there was another theory that the car only went halfway off the bridge and then Kennedy tries to jump out and upon doing that kind of displaces the weight, which pushes it over into the water. Yeah, there's this investigator that got hired after the fact that was like so sure this is what happened. But all I could remember was that this investigator was famous for swimming in the East River. <laughs> like Kramer. In Jersey? No, in the East River in New York. Like oh, Kramer, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Kramer on Seinfeld. <laughs> So it's like, I just, am discounting. That's such a good episode. <laughs> it's so good. Just so, trash and stuff flying yeah, by. Yeah, just, and he was like, don't do it at low tide. <laughs> well, my question with these series are, do, does any of this make it better or worse than what probably actually happened? Like, why do we need another theory? Yeah, and I was like, I don't know why, if none of these things seem particularly bad, that what, his story actually seems like the worst. So why would it, yeah, he be hiding a better sounding theory yeah. than the other ones? If he, if he didn't know she was in the car. That then, absolves him. Yeah, why That's wouldn't not... you just, I mean, go report it to the police, like, hey, I was in this accident, my car's in the river, so tomorrow if somebody finds it, this is why. FYI. And then they're like, a lady was in it. And he's like, a lady was in it? What? Yeah. yeah I don't yeah, know. It doesn't, I don't buy it. It doesn't make sense. I, I think that what happened is he knew she was in the car and did not try. And he may have, I think he may have actually tried to save her. Like jumped back in once or twice. I think just because he, he doesn't want, if he had saved her, this wouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. They, you know, I mean, so I do think he probably tried to, to get her out and couldn't, but then went into panic mode and cover up mode and... The fact that he he claims that he had doctors say he had a concussion and everything, and he was in a state of shock, and he didn't know what. It, that's why he didn't report it. In the movie, they have this doctor come in, and the advisors are like, "All right, so the doctor will say he had a concussion, blah blah." And the doctor's like, "I haven't even examined him," and they're like, "And you're not going to." That's not. That's the point. exactly what happened on OJ. Yeah. Where they're like, come in and just say the, say these things. And, and the doctor's like, well, that doctor was like, yeah, right. I'm yeah, sorry. so I'm they're sorry. getting paid off and pressured by a political family. They're like, do you want to lose your license? Yeah, and so they basically concoct this story of why he didn't. Did the doctor even say that? Because the guy who wrote the speech was the speechwriter for JFK's uh, Ask Not What Your Country Can Do For You speech. So they just got a really good speechwriter to write this televised yeah, that's apology. that's exactly who did it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a whole mess. And the sad thing is no one will know the truth. No, because after, That's after the, he apologized, I was going to say, after he apologized on the news, it was not mentioned really until a story, a, a book, 
uh, was published in 1992 that really laid out, and it was like 20 years of research. This guy dedicated his life to this book, and his name's Leo Damore. He, I mean, and that's what the movie is based on, and uh, a lot of, this, and, and it was tons of research. And he told his kid, he's like, I get calls that are like, stop looking into this, stop asking questions. Still to this day? Well, he's dead. I guess in the 90s. Yeah, yeah, in the 90s. And he told his son one time, he's like, I have a box of things for you under my bed. And he took all of his tapes and everything and all of his research and took it to Kent State, like their library. Wow. But his son is like thinking that somebody's gone in to quote unquote look at it, but then like scrubbed it from some for some of the stuff. But yeah, his, unfortunately, sadly, Leo Damore, uh, killed himself. He committed suicide and his son, uh, after they did an autopsy on him, they found a brain tumor pushing down on a part of his brain that can cause like suicidal yeah. ideations and thoughts. And his son said that, um, both Ted Kennedy and his dad, they, he thinks the son thinks that they were poison, aluminum poisoning, which is like over a long period because there was a comment by one of the Kennedy camp like one of the people in the kennedy camp that was like oh if you want to assassinate someone you don't have to just use a bullet they're slow and painful how would ways. they have gotten the aluminum i don't and he i think the son is making a documentary that hasn't come oh. out yet that's um his he his dad's uh tombstone said uh seek ye the truth or ye shall seek the truth or whatever uh -huh. and so it kind of inspired the son to like start writing a documentary and making a documentary so about his dad his dad may he have thinks his dad going on well his dad did all this research and had like the true story yeah and then um he also thinks that ted kennedy uh was because ted kennedy died of a brain tumor too oh so he thinks that, that the family that the did family, this to both of well them. that ted kennedy was getting old and was starting to be like ah oh, i feel bad about this. this is what really happened deathbed confession well that's what the family of Mary Jo are hoping for is a deathbed confession. If someone knows something and they'll finally in upon their deathbed, they're finally going to say well, Ted really Kennedy happened. sure didn't. Nope. Uh, maybe Joe or Paul or somebody else that knows something, but this, I can't imagine anything. You already lose a parent, a kid. And the second worst thing is not knowing what really happened. It's like no closure, no, zero closure. Your mind plays out a diff million different scenarios and you just drive yourself crazy. Yeah. It's horrible. It's, it's awful. So what do you think? What do we think is the explanation for what happened? I think, I think it's the, what, what he says. Yeah. I think that she was, was asleep in the back seat. And that he saw her and was like, oh, she's back there. Eh, fuck it. I'm going to drive back to town anyway. And then he does crash and then can't. Like, I don't know that she was, like, volitionally riding with him just based on, like, her injuries and the fact that she was in the back seat. But then again, if she was in the front seat and it crashed headfirst in there, she would have swam upward to try to get to air. So, I don't know. Yeah. I think um, she may have been found in the back seat because of the way the car was positioned. That's where the air was. Yeah. She was, like, like yeah. uh, trying to get to the air. So. Um, I think that the that they probably left together so kennedy said too that he didn't know that that bridge would have led to a beach that they couldn't get to pass but it was well known that he and mary joe had been to that beach before so a lot of people assume while it doesn't sound like she was having a relationship with him that maybe they were going there to to do something or who knows yeah um but i think that he knew she, they, they were riding together. He crashed and knowingly left her there to die. And what a sad, sad way to go. Well, does that define him? Ooh, I like how you brought that back. Does this, does this incident that he had you know, this, take away the things that about he... this question long into the night? Because this really is a, is a brain teaser. You know, it's like, does, does the one incident of him being, you know, he's in his thirties or whatever. 37. And, yeah. And his thirties fucks him up. Do you think if something, you did something now that that, that should define you everything for the rest of your life? I think I would hope it wouldn't. I think that there are kind of two types of people in this world. One that would learn from this and use it to change for the better. And one that would, well, I guess three types. The other type would let it define them and just spiral into a depression mm -hmm. and it would sink them. Or the third, they run from it and have no accountability and just kind of continue to go on with their life as if it didn't happen. I, I mean, like to think I would be the first type of person. Well, hopefully. And I mean, you know, you, and, and was the good that he did in repentance for the crime that he committed, you know, it, whether it was, a you know, on paper, a homicide or, you know, just hanging over his soul that, you know, he ended up 
uh, pushing for economic sanctions against South Africa and the apartheid movement. He acted as a go-between for Gorbachev and the Reagan administration. He, he like famously, you know, they overread, uh, over run Reagan's veto, um, on the economic sanctions because the apartheid was going on. And it was like, you know, he, he was like a human He did a lot of good. I don't think that those things excuse what he did or make it okay. I still don't have an answer of does this define him? Because I'm now thinking of other criminals and things like... Well, not other criminals get to go on to be a senator for 50 some odd years. Also, uh, something that you may be interested in. Do you remember uh, Robert Bork? No. He was a a candidate for the Supreme Court under Reagan and he was a original constitutional originalist. I will say I don't think that gay marriage would be legal if Robert Bork had gotten appointed and the biggest fighter against Robert Bork was Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy was like, he will undo the civil rights law. He wow. will undo civil rights for women, minorities, people in this country. We cannot have him on the Supreme Court. And he made a fucking huge stink about it. And like the thing. I mean, he was a bleeding heart liberal. Huge There's no, liberal. no huge, question huge liberal. about it. He did a lot of good for things I am very passionate about. So again, I he still, was, also, I, I'm going to have a lot of moral things to come to terms that's with. Like thing. So, so Lin-Manuel Miranda, the, the guy who wrote Hamilton talks yes. about that in life, because even Aaron Burr, you know, shot Alexander Hamilton sure. or whatever. He has like, a why he has like an underlying not necessarily redeeming quality but like an underlying why and uh lynn mamel miranda has like some quote i can't remember it but it's something like i don't believe in mustache twirling villains like there aren't are there these people that are just wrongdoers just for the sake of wrong or self-interested or what about serial killers that's a great question i don't know because that's what i'm thinking about if you're is that even a person or is that a monster i don't know well and are there people you, that you can't reach ever because their because brain is broken? Health, yeah. Their brains. I mean, not to say, say that in a mean way, but like they literally can't feel. Mm-hmm. And is this guy? Yeah. Is, and I don't think Ted Kennedy. I don't that. either. And and that's when you think about like, does this define him? He, when he was alive, I guarantee you not a day went by that this did not. Oh, plague no. Him. Yeah. So when you're alone by yourself and at night trying to go to sleep. And this is all you can think about. Oh, I bet he Maybe had, like, nightmares. Maybe there is something to the judge saying no sentence I can impose will be nearly as he had harmful a, as what he's going to go through. A lifelong. He also super opposed Clarence Thomas, and he d- grilled Clarence Thomas and was like, will you overturn Roe v. Wade? This is women have a fundamental right to, you know, their own body. Be curious to know how what he would be doing now if he was alive in yeah. our current political climate. Probably... Probably, you know, the same. I mean, he was a lot the lion of the Senate. I mean, he was a liberal lion of the Senate. He did not back down. He he let everyone know how he felt. That's why it's almost uh, disappointing and surprising that he did react the way he did. Can we just say, though, he named his dog Splash? (laughs) Yikes. Maybe he didn't think about it ever again. Oopsie daisy. (laughs) Or he's just so dim that that didn't even occur to him. (laughs) This I mean, might be a little bit of an oopsie daisy. What do you think? Do you think it defines him? I just don't think. I mean, I I think he's not a psychopath. He was a person that hit his, you know, fortunately for all of us, his one bad act, the redemption that he sought his whole entire life had a huge positive impact on the rest of us. Sure. So it's, so it's like, those... do you sacrifice one for the greater good no. type of thing? Oh. I'm not saying that's what he did. We should have say her life was sacrificed. No, for the but like good, morally, but... do you yes. think he was like trying to prove or even like JFK and RFK? They said, he, you know, his whole life, he was like, I want to just do what my brothers did. Like, I want to like fulfill their legacy. But would he have done those things had she still lived? Do you, are you, do you think that her death is what, kind of prompted him to do all of these things it did sort of wake him up it shook the shit out of him and was like you're an adult now you're in charge of the family now get your shit together so again we go back to kind of the butterfly effect if this hadn't happened would all those other things have happened yeah and if you think well he should have gone to jail he should have been you know put in prison for 30 years would robert bork be on the supreme court and then gay marriage would be illegal like i don't know yeah that's all me i mean the only thing i do know is i Bet the Kopechnies would sacrifice all of that to have their daughter. Absolutely. Back. I mean, then that's that's the uh, the mother and father's love. Yes, definitely. Man, it was a heavy subject today. Yeah, but I it, I love it's I love good <laughs> though. It, it, it's making me really think. I'm t- I'm telling you, I'm going to be up tonight trying to plan Ella's first birthday. 
all on Pinterest, but in the back of my head, like, does this define him as a person? <laughs> Jovember F. Kennedy will yeah, do it for you. I like it. Well, do we have any shout outs? Uh, just everybody that listens all okay. the time. And any specific Lucy. Ones. Yeah, the goose. Hi, Lucy. Lucy's been uh, helping in this episode. She's been very good. She has been. Well, the best thing you guys can do to help us grow is to like, review, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you see any contests, you should nominate us for it. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what's out in the world? <laughs> yeah, we, we found out about a contest today that we would have loved to have been nominated for. It's already passed. Next so year. So we did not win. But uh, next year, also tell we're going to be nominated. Yeah, definitely share this with a friend, especially I've seen a lot of posts on Facebook that are like, I finished listening to a podcast. What should I start? now hey mm-hmm. how about this also uh if you just tell your friends it just means that you like us enough to say something that's really cool yes we um, get very excited and we'll screenshot stuff and send it to each other when people on instagram or facebook or twitter like uh message us suggest or suggest oh, us yeah. to a friend like or us. something yeah, it's, yeah it makes us feel very special speaking of instagram and twitter you can follow us at sinisterhood pod and like us on facebook at sinisterhood christy where can the fine the fine folks find you on social media on social <laughs> <laughs> that they can find me on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. I'm on Instagram at Heather versus the world or at Instagram at MC or on Twitter at MCK versus the world. Can we also plug Lucy's? She doesn't have one. I thought Lucy and Goose had an Instagram. You can follow I mean, the, Lucy and Buffy. You can hashtag it's hashtag Buffy and the Goose, and it's like uh, every picture I post to them is all that hashtag. Okay, There's so like, if you want to see all of Heather's great pictures, you of can her follow dogs. you can follow the hashtag Buffy and the Goose all together, and they are very cute. They're super cute. Yes. Well, as always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Sin is-